What's your story? What's your sign? It's like we're twin flames in a different life. Deep connection, lights a spark. It's like you know me in the depths of my heart. We're dreamers. What's up everyone conrad newfelt here thanks for joining us and today we're talking about bidding wars and i thought who better to talk to about bidding wars than someone who has had a tremendous amount of experience with it mitch cleary from peterborough ontario hey mitch how's it going good conrad thanks for having me on thank you for the introduction uh excited to be here so tell me a bit about yourself for those that may not know who you are sure so um in, in regards to tackling this topic today, I'm uh, a realtor in Peterborough, Ontario. Uh, I've only been in the business for, for two full years now, but had two very busy, blessed and beautiful years. Um, I think that's on account of me being born and raised in this town. And I, most of my entire working life leading up to this business was in uh, the new home construction business. So it's sort of integrally related with understanding the local market itself. And uh, a lot of me and my friends, my whole life growing up have been, you know, I was sort of the one who was chatting with them about houses and real estate anyhow, uh, with no ambition of ever getting into this business. It's just the way that it veered as, as my family <laughs> business went on and, and, and sort of took a turn and I took my own road. Um, so so that's that's one thing that really helped me have a leg up getting started in terms of um, really just understanding the real estate seen in Peterborough and, and some of, I guess, more so, even more importantly, probably the, the macroeconomic side of what makes the market tick. Um, because I grew up with a father who, who, uh, would, would lay awake at night worrying about what was going to happen with the market. Cause he was thinking about, you know, am I going to take the, the money from these 35 homes I just sold and, and roll it over into the next 60 lots I buy, or do I clinch back right now? So he was always thinking in these long, like 
two, three, four, five year projection. So spent a lot of time talking around about that around my house growing up. So, um, <laughs> so anyways, so, now, so what you're saying is now that you have a, a child of your own, you're going to have to lay awake at night. So that they have that influence so they can join, they can join. Oh, real yeah. Estate. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. We have, I have three young boys and, uh, they haven't started having a list of my real estate rants yet. That's, <laughs> yes, that's yes. Definitely, I do. Yeah, I do totally. spend way too much time thinking about this stuff because it matters, right? Um, you're going to invite somebody to buy or sell and, and you want to know if they say is now a good time or a bad time. You got to take that question extremely seriously when we see well, such volatility in prices right now. And let's be serious. Like there's more, there's more to it than just the volatility of the prices too. I mean, it's dangerous for me as a mortgage broker to say, but like, Realtors, let's be serious, like 80% of them are not good at what they do, right? <laughs> like there's like, it's terrible to say, but it's true. Like there are some realtors that are very, very gifted, very good at what they do worth every mm. penny, right? But they're mm. like, they're like the 20%, they're the minority, right? And I think that the good ones excel and the bad ones eventually go away. But particularly when you're dealing with these kind of economic environments where you're dealing with, you know, a lot of bidding wars, a lot of high price pressures, which we're seeing in across the country, like you guys in Ontario, you've, you, you've experienced this before, but a lot of people in Saskatchewan, Alberta, you know, Manitoba, they haven't seen these, these bidding wars before. Like this is new to them. Right. Especially for some of these younger agents and they got hit. Like, and there were some people who suffered because of it. Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think there's, you know, there's a lot of things going on, but having the experience or the knowledge or the um, the ability to like really press through it and do it in, in a way that, you know, you can advise your clients is, is a good thing. So like mm. kind of one of the first places I want to start is, you know, what is a bidding war, you know, cause I think everybody has a different, you know, it sounds weird cause everyone's like, what's well, a bidding war, you know, ramp up of prices, but there's actually more going on there, particularly when you see articles of the government, you know, saying, Hey, you know, let's target blind bidding, but like, what is a bidding war? How does blind bidding play into that? Mm -hmm. oh, totally, kind of totally. Yeah, I mean, you can explain it in so many different ways of saying it. Um, you can go as far, you can explain it. And here's the thing. I heard a great thing actually uh, last night of, of watching a documentary on quantum physics of all things. But it was, it said, <laughs> you can, they said there's some of these theories when you, there's differences in translations when you explain things in one language to the next from, from, from Mandarin to English. And so when scientists all want to talk about a topic in the exact same terms, they have to speak in one language, mathematics. And that's, that's what, that's what a bidding war boils down to mathematics. One seller, three buyers, you know, you just don't have, you don't, you're out of balance. You have more buyers than sellers by a large margin. It doesn't even have to be a large margin, but it's large enough that you have um, uh, you, you have you have you're out of kilter in terms of how your supply can service your demand. And it's as simple as three people wanting one house and one seller. And then that no matter what way you break it down, whoever doesn't get that house, they just roll over onto bidding onto the next one. And as long as we continue to have more people looking to buy at any given point in time, the new inventory coming on, bidding wars will exist. So do you feel like do you feel like the blind bidding though? Because that seemed that seemed to be like the darling um, darling thing to go after as far as like the you know that's the reason why it's it's the bidding yeah. it's the blind bidding. Like how do you feel like that? Yeah. Impacts it? So I think that the the blind bidding it, it is a very important topic, um, but. The, okay, so so this is actually a pretty large topic. So I'm going to try and break it down into a couple couple of, uh, of sections here because this is a, there's actually a lot of meat on this bone more than a lot of people think at, at like a glance because um, I spent a lot of time thinking about this. And and basically, one thing I want to say that you said something earlier that already dovetails in this conversation is that this the bidding wars are relatively new out, out in your uh, neck of the woods in Saskatchewan mm -hmm. and, and and some of the some of central Ontario, you know, central western. Um, obviously, it's been on the west coast uh, for quite some time. Uh, because you know BC and, and Ontario are the are the the hubs of the bidding wars, but um, the fact that you guys are just seeing it now and it's been going on for years here. I actually sold a house in Alberta in Red Deer, Alberta. Uh, oh, geez, probably about a year and a half ago at, at like a forty thousand dollar loss, and I'd owned the thing for seven years. So how do people go ahead and and, and say that? Because the biggest thing is the bidding wars, the blind bidding wars. It's the realtors basically they painted the realtors out to be the enemy here, and that it's this whole. Um, it's this whole construct that whereby they can get the most money when they up the per sale price, they get more commission, but it's such a faulty notion because realistically uh, free economics actually did a good segment uh, on this on one of their things on Netflix, but um, in oh, terms really? of 
pure incentive, uh, just on this exact this exact section I'm about to talk about, is that the incentives for a realtor are not to get the most price for a home. They're to get the transaction completed and done because 100%. marginally speaking, to get an extra $20,000 on, on the purchase price or even another $50,000, it, it, it might represent another an extra $2,000 on a commission that's already $15,000. So to push that much extra harder, to push, 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 push when you might lose a deal, the, the incentive actually doesn't exist there to get the most money for people. Yeah. So, so the, it's just the, the incentive is more rigged for realtors just to get the job done, get the deal done, get it closed. So people got to realize that, that the incentive isn't actually there for the realtors to get the most. It's not greedy realtors. Greedy realtors would, would try and just get a medium amount of money and get the deal done as close as quickly, as reliably as possible. But a lot of times the buyers, the sellers end up having end up taking the one that's the most money. Uh, just because they, the, it's actually the seller that wants most money because that's logically human nature. Why would you take anything less unless you're suffering <laughs> a reasonably a, a, pro, a, a reasonably high probability that that person would not follow through on closing on the deal? In which case, your realtor would probably advise you that anyhow. So it's natural. It's a natural progression that the most money is probably always going to win. Yeah, you as uh, a seller, not, I mean, it's a no-brainer. You take for the sure, highest the amount of driving money. Driving you know, it's not the realtors driving mo because it doesn't make us that much <laughs> extra more money to get that much extra more sale price for the house. So, so, but, but what I want to go back to is the fact that in a market like Saskatchewan, where you guys didn't have bidding wars, they've been going on here for years. Okay. So what's the difference? Are the realtors in Ontario just greedier than Saskatchewan ones? Did Saskatchewan ones not, not come up with this in time earlier? No. Yes. The fact of the matter is, is oh, that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, but, but, but so, 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 and Hey, and, and by no means, like keep, keep in mind, I am a realtor by profession. It's my trade. I appreciate what I do. I, I totally respect and, 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 and enjoy it, but I'm not, I'm not some staunch defender of the old guard here. Like I, I understand what real estate is and what it isn't as, as you know, and and I'm trying to look at this all objectively and just take it in. Um, and and you know, say, it's funny. It's funny you mentioned like the whole like Saskat like like you're talking about are they greedier? Because if you look at Australia as an example, Australia mm -hmm. has had an open bidding system for well a long time, right? Mm -hmm. Like they haven't they've gone away from the blind bidding system. And there's a couple other nuances, but for the most part, you know, it's it's open. There's people who will physically show up in front of a house and cast ballots on a house, and yet. If you look at what happened in Australia, it's it's actually like very, very similar to what happened in Canada over these last, I would say, two, four, five years. Yeah, it's just supply and demand. Like people, you can't, you can't, you can't articulate it in enough ways. The 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 best way is the most simplified way, because I can approach it in so many, so many ways of looking at it. But to put it simply, you could not have created, you could not have created a bidding war in Black Falls, Alberta. In 2017, if you tried, the only way you would have done it, because here's the thing, I know because I went to sell a property at that time, and you when when there's when there's 30 properties identical to yours listed within a within like a two kilometer proximity, and everyone is leaving that province because the price of oil and the the oil employment has crashed. It's it's a matter of demographics, it's a matter of arithmetic. People are leaving, the homes are empty. There's no bidding war to be had. You can be a realtor. You can try anything you want. You will not create a bidding war unless you take a $400,000 home and try listing it for $150,000. But even then, it's not going to be where you're going to get 30 people to show up and it's going to bid up 50 grand above its market value. What's going to happen is people are going to very suspiciously kind of poke around and, and you're, you're, you're going to get obviously a little bit more showing activity than you would, but you're, no one's going to compete because there's no incentive to compete because if people miss this home at 150, they can just go put a low ball offer in and one of the 30 other homes listed, they're identical right. the same that have been up for three to six months on the market. Yeah, when for you sure. Miss, when you miss one in Ontario, you know what happens? You, your, your wife just got all attached to that house because she liked the way that the back porch was, whatever, whatever. And it might not be another year until you see one on that same street and it's going to be seventy thousand to a hundred thousand dollars more so the incentive is to go for it but in alberta there was less people than homes there's no bidding wars there's nothing you could even do to create one you can't fabricate it so so it's just, it's just how, how else do you say it? it's supply and demand we have a, we have we have a, a government who's restricted our supply chronically for so many years so and, talk to me about that like because i would agree with you and i yep. think and i and to be fair um, and people who watch my channel know that, um, you know, you can like Trudeau for the things he's done well, and you can hate Trudeau for the things he's done poorly, but mm -hmm. he is not a financial mind. He is like, mm -hmm. he does not have a good grasp of finances and that's just been proven over and over and over and over again. But I would all, I would say not to his defense, but I would say that this, this problem is goes beyond just when he started. 
right? Because like you, you were a home builder, right? And you know, like if someone wants to increase supply mm -hmm. um, from a strictly just like, we're not talking policies, we're we'll come back to that. But mm -hmm. when you're talking about the, the actual building of the houses, you find that plot of land, a developer goes into it, subdivides it, you know, you know, actually give, like services it, builds a home on it, whatever. By the time they like find that land and do all of their underwriting and due diligence, and by the time someone actually like turns a key and moves into that, you're talking about five to seven years. Like that's yeah. not that's not a short amount of time. So, but I think though that the problems have gotten worse under Trudeau. So it, it's not just him; he inherited some of it, but he's definitely made it worse. So, like, talk to me about housing policies because I think it's not just the federal policies either. I think it's both federal and provincial and municipal. I think all three levels it is, have it really is. Yeah, you're right. screwed it up. Hundred percent. So, um, yeah, I mean, where to start on this one? That's a big one too because there's it's poor it's poor planning it's poor planning because again it comes back to the math the mathematics of what is your population growth going to be over x amount of years um interprovincially that's very difficult to predict because it's hard for peterborough say to predict the 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 population inflows that might come from inner province based on because a lot of them are based on job swings and they could just never predict if oh all of a sudden like some strange thing happens and like uh, a big factory, an Amazon plant wants to land in Peterborough. It's looked favorably upon it and they could not have predicted this in a, in, in a, you know, a hundred year scope. And all of a sudden Amazon wants to come here and there's, they're going to create 5,000 jobs. Obviously the city has to, to solicit this and they would have had already had the commercial land available somewhat projected in their, in their, in their master plan, how this was all going to play out. But it's but, an outlier. Yeah, but you can't, but you can't, you can't predict population growth within exacts within, you know, interprovincially, but in the province as a whole, the, uh, Ontario, they have a relatively good idea what's going to happen with population because we have stats, Canada, we have census, we have all the information, how old are people, what's the death rate, what's the more, like how old, how long are people going to live, how many people are being born every year, what's the average birth rate in the households, what's the average death rate in these households, how many people are immigrating, it's, it's, it's yeah. simple as that. You can have outlier <laughs> years where you have more deaths or more births, but or or immigration that's that's artificially controlled. But but within within some range, mm -hmm. they know what our population will be, and yep. accordingly, they have to be able to predict how many homes we will need. And okay, so, like on that, so like so, nineteen seventies as an example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, nineteen seventies Ontario, I think was building like thirty thousand homes a year. I think that was the, that's the number. Um, and then, and, and right now it's about 20,000 homes. A year. Like it's, it's gone down. It's basically, it's been 20,000 homes for quite a, quite in a Ontario, while, you right? mean? Yeah. Is um, it higher? well, it depends if you talk detached or, or mid, mid like if you get, if you right. get towns and, and everything involved in high rise. Um, because last I saw, like, there's been a couple of years they, they pumped out, you know, 60 plus, but mind you, bear in mind, 60,000 homes, 300,000 new immigrants in one year. So. Mm. The average, yeah. the, 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 the occupant rate of a household is, is approximately, I believe it was 2.9. So call it, call it three people per household. So 300,000 sure. new people move here. You need a hundred thousand new dwellings in theory that, that year. Well, and, well, and that was to my point, you know, if, if you look at the population of Ontario, it went from, I think it was, well, I had the note here, 7.5 million in 1970 to 15 million, you know, in 2021. So it's, yeah. it's doubled in population in 40 years, but I can tell you the housing hasn't doubled in, in, in no, 40 no. years. And so, so, <laughs> so we're all bringing, let me bring, I want to cycle this back one more time to try and illuminate this for people is that just imagine, just imagine like, so Alberta in, in the, in the past years, and I mean, Alberta's uh, Calgary's office space is still, still this way is a bounty of options and choice for buyers. There's just more physical properties than people looking to buy them. And in we we have been running out of product for years and if you look at basically let's let's say someone tries to host a bidding war in i, I always thought of this analogy i don't know why but imagine you go into a best buy and for some reason there's a whole row full of macs and all these all these laptops you can choose from and then there's this promotion going on over in the corner you know <laughs> blind bidding war for this mac and, and and is it logical to think that if all the ones on the shelf are priced for a thousand dollars that there's any way there's any possible way that this mac is going to sell for twelve hundred dollars it's not it's not no one no single individual will possibly pay that much when they can say, well, I'm just going to, my tap out is bare minimum, probably 900. Cause I don't know what's wrong with this thing. I can buy them for a thousand off the shelf. What if this gets deemed to be some floor metal? I have no warranty. So no one's going to exceed that. But then just imagine all of a sudden you walk into that same store and they tell you, and this could happen now, this is starting to happen everywhere with the scarcity due to all our supply chain blockages and inflation. But imagine you walk into the exact same Best Buy 
And you said, where's all the laptops? There's nothing on the shelf. This is kind of like when you walk into HomeSense now, or sometimes when you walk into the produce aisle at Costco. And you said, where's all, where's all the laptops? And they say, oh, actually, last MacBook Pro, you're going to get for an entire year. You know, you, mm -hmm. you they could stand at that door and say, live or blind anymore, it doesn't matter. That sucker's going to go for whatever price someone's willing to pay that day. And so, so the whole reason that these bidding wars are happening is, is because – not because of, of a, uh, a systematic error in the mechanism of the selling. It's the, the mechanism at that final point is so far down that road where if there's only one Mac left, that's anyone's going to try and capitalize on how much they can so get then, for it. So let's talk about this because there's more than one, there's more than one actor and actress involved in this, in this story. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the government is obviously part of it. And so let's say the government really truly did, you know, screw up, you know, they, they mm -hmm. didn't forecast the proper growth. They didn't forecast the proper, you know, whatever, right. You still have builders who in theory, you know, like put the shoe on the other foot. you got a builder. They go, wow, all this growth and all these bidding wars. I want to become a builder. I want to be, a, I want to build more homes. And yet they're precluded from doing that. Right. And so there's a lot of red tape. Now in Saskatchewan, it's different. There, we're getting more red tape in Alberta. There has been more red tape in recent years. Um, but I, I feel like Ontario is just a beast in its own. Right. Yeah. So, so like, actually this, this tips onto a very beautiful, beautiful topic because this gets to the heart of it. I thought long and hard about this because I was actually supposed to be doing a podcast uh, a few weeks ago with the Rockstar Real Estate Group. I don't know if you want, they, they run an awesome podcast and YouTube channel. If you guys no, haven't, check it out. Amazing, yeah. amazing quality of information. Um, but I was really trying to dive deep into this because I knew we were going to get onto this topic when I went there. Is is it, Here's the thing, is that the nimbyism is is really because politically, yes, you have the, on the federal, you have the federal, you have the provincial and you, and you have the municipal level. But here's what I've noticed is that there's a duality in people's own line of thinking. People who are liberal on the federal level, they think, yes, pro-immigration, yes, pro-benefits mm. um, and subsidies, pro, you know, basically like pro-inflationary pressures. Um, they, they, at their municipal level, at their own home, on their own street, on their block, they show up to council meetings and say, no, I don't want that tower at the end of my street because, <laughs> because it's going to decrease my property value. So you have the same person who's acting liberally on the federal stage they're very conservative when it gets municipal, but the rubber meets the road at the municipal level. That's where construction happens. So mm -hmm. when you have people that bring out the pitchforks every time some new project goes to get passed in their neighborhood. So, so NIMBYism is really, really, really what's at the heart of this whole thing. It's, it <laughs> it is. reminds it, me of like the nineties when everyone was like nuclear power, that's the way to go. I think it was eighties or nineties nuclear power. That's the way to go. And like they did a study on Canadians and Canadians were like, I can't remember what the percentage is, but it was like it was like eighty percent of Canadians want a nuclear power plant, but like nobody wants it in their nobody pockets. wants it near that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, everybody That's wants it. it, but nobody That's wants it, it in their it. province. It's like, how do I say it? How do I say it? Imagine there's someone. Imagine there's someone in the gym that that's like. Um, hasn't been there in like four years for however you want to envision an out of shape person, whatever you want to envision it. I don't want to isolate anybody or, or alienate yeah. anybody. Imagine there's somebody that clearly just, you know what I mean? Whatever dad, bar, just whatever they're walking to the gym and they just start lecturing everyone on like, people got to start working out. They're not healthy enough. They're all dying. They're all dying. You guys got to keep going harder, but he never goes. So these are all these people. So many people are like pro growth, pro immigration, like, like, and, and also, also, also pro um, environmental protectionism, which of course we do need. There's, it's, it, you know what I mean? There's overwhelming evidence starting to come in of it. Everybody, it, you know, I, I'm a bit of an environmentalist myself at heart. I really am. I, I, I appreciate all nature's beauty and I don't want to, I don't want everyone to act like just, I have a building background. That's not my, that's not my, my, my MO is build, 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 run over all the land. But here's the problem is that this, the same people that want to protect the land they, they want more people to move here, but they don't realize that for people to move here, we have to build dwellings. And to build dwellings, we need the land. And, 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 and in some cases, you don't even need the land. In some cases, you just need more, more density. So you need high rise. But in a city like Peterborough, we see this all the time where people mm -hmm. do not want certain heights of buildings. No, no, no. I don't want some six story high building on my street. I don't want it on yeah. my street because it'll block the views. Well, then what do you want to do? Do you want to use up six plots of land instead? No, you don't because you're the environmentalist. So it's the same guy in the gym. Well, like that, the never the infrastructure. That's the infrastructure. So in, in the use of the infrastructure, they're having to build the infrastructure, stretch it, build more. So so it's like this guy who never goes to the gym and they're yelling at everyone that they got to go. It's people have got to be pro housing in their own backyard. People, yep. people are pointing a finger. Everyone's doing it. Everyone's doing it. Everyone's pointing a finger. 
and they're not like, yeah, put that tower in my backyard. So that's where it, that's the that's the crux of this whole thing because the municipalities can't get it through, and the federal government can't force the hand on the municipalities because municipalities have their own unique issues and mandate to deal with. They have their own budget, mm -hmm. and they just here's but the there's problem. there's where there's a bit of conflict um, in in that right because as a municipal leader and well even as a federal leader mm -hmm. you are. <laughs> you're stuck at the will of the people in, in, in a sense, right? Because if you screw up enough things, they just won't vote you in anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, so, so if you go into a, a certain municipality and you say, Hey guys, we're going to cram this place with a bunch of new houses. People will be like, like, hell you are. My street's going to get too busy. My kid isn't going to be able to play hockey on the street or bike in the road or cross the street without looking or the, you know, we're going to have to decrease the the speed limit or whatever, yeah, right? Like that interplay of the political balance, right? That's right. And so what ends up happening is people are all like, we want, you know, we want, you know, more houses. We want houses to be affordable, but then are also at odds with like, it's conflicted, right? And it's, and it's not it to say, like, it's just not an easy answer. Like there's just no, no, no it's a very answer. nuanced, it's a very nuanced situation. So, so I, I, I think of this more like, um, I thought of this analogy this morning because sometimes like i can be a little hard on our current government but i do sympathize like no one knows what what the, the guy sitting in the big chair shoes has to deal with in a day but him like you know the the oh, trudeaus sure. the trudeaus the harpers like man i take my hat off to anybody who can just put up with people for that long you know i wouldn't want their job you, we get five <laughs> bad youtube comments it's like oh oh you know you know like you have one bad review of from a real estate transaction these guys got to deal with so many opinions they're trying to please everybody it's such a difficult job so as much as i do do knock on our current government i take my hat off to any government for being uh willing to represent their country but what i would say is that Th this this is sometimes we can be so hard on them because we're talking we think of the government as though like they are steering a ship and we're all on, on it you know or like we 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 look at it as like they they basically have control of the weather and it's like oh interest rates like throttle up the the this a little bit throttle that down that a little bit and like incentives over here and incentives over there but i think it's more like like the government is 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 in a ship that's not like a cruise ship it's like a mid-sized old <laughs> pirate sailboat and they're out at the ocean because mother nature can come in with a tsunami, like one crack of a fault plate while you're out at sea, even with the best, like we have such economic predictive, like we have such smart economists in our governments and in our society today that they can predict, but there's so many invariabilities and probabilities. There's so much, so much interconnection. Yes, no, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of people, a lot of economists who like missed the mark. In a lot yeah, of ways. yeah, there is, there and is, there is, but and it led to some say, like very dangerous recommendations. <laughs> there is, there is, there's different theories on money, and it's all so it gets down to philosophical beliefs. Um, but the problem is what I was gonna veer back to is I think people give too much credit to the notion that the government has so much control over this thing. What I what I vision it more as is like they're a ship out at sea and the weather's nasty, it can happen, anything can happen in a heartbeat. And even though you know there could be a storm coming in X amount of days and you try and plan for it, you can't predict for for a fault plate shifting, uh, you know, in an opening of tectonic plate and then a tsunami and a whatever, an earthquake. Like you can't predict right. that when you're at it. So, so you can't, so there's things like COVID that no government could have predicted. We could yeah. have had oh, notions for sure. for sure. So we could have had notions about the threat of viral, you know, whatever, I'm not going to call it viral, you know, whatever. It could be whatever it is, whatever the causes were. You can theorize about that all day, but you cannot predict the timing, the severity of an event like that. So you the government funny is though? Like on the COVID thing, I actually predicted that housing prices were going to go up because of COVID. I was wrong as to the reason why, but I predicted because in my head, I was like, okay, what's going to happen is there's going to be a ton of people stuck at home, unable to go buy properties, look at properties or whatever. And then as a result, nobody's going to be finishing any of their builds because, and nobody's going to be selling either. So I actually was like, housing prices are going to increase because supply is going to decrease. And what was funny, what ended up happening was supply actually increased year over year, but oddly demand increased even more than that. So the same effect yeah. occurred, but just instead of supply Which going down, a, demand going up. It was a totally, totally unpredictable socioeconomic effect of people living in their house 24 seven, realizing that they really do need that extra covered space or that they do need an extra, like, for example, a lot of people needed a home office because they could not predictably produce their work outcome of knowledge work that they needed to in a house where they didn't have a separate place to work with three kids at home from school. So there's a lot of shifts in people's need for housing. 
it, it, it drove everyone into their homes. So it drove the the what people needed out of their homes up. So so the usage okay. of the home. And so on up. that point, on mm -hmm. that point, we saw. So not only did we see, you know, um, bidding wars going across the, the province, like into provinces that other, like would typically not experience bidding wars um, consistently. Right. Like there's obviously been bidding wars in every single province throughout history. Mm -hmm. that, that That's a given. But mm -hmm. it's been consistent. But what we noticed, though, with a lot of these these shift, so like, look at us, for example, like I used to have an office, my staff used to be there with me. I don't have an office anymore. We all work from home. And we have zero intent. Like if, if the pandemic ended tomorrow, we have zero intent to go back, right? And I think there's quite a few people in that situation, too, that have migrated out of central, um, like central Toronto and stuff like that, the main districts there, mm -hmm. and have taken that bidding war with them because basically it's like they've kicked the rat nest and now all these neighboring territories, and you must be seeing this, all these neighboring territories are now experiencing bidding wars even more furiously and more consistent than previous, right? Mm. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. Which which that's where all of that, look at how complicated that is. Look, who could have predicted that at the outset? Who could have won A, predicted the timing and severity of a, of, 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 of a pandemic, and B, predicted the exact way that A, the socioeconomic preference for housing would shift and the work from home potential would shift and the amount of knowledge work, the, the, the variables and the factors involved, there's myriad things. That oh yeah, it's that insane. No one ever could have predicted, including the most competent, even, you know, as much as I, I, I also, I love the Steve Harper government. And I, I don't think the Steve Harper government, they, I think they would have reacted much differently, but Mm -hmm. How do you predict this and how do you react to this? It's extremely difficult. So that's all. And that's the last, that's the last pat on the back I'm going to give our current government. But I just needed to, <laughs> I needed to, I needed to, I needed to um, precursor that because sometimes I can get a little bit too negative on it. Um, but it just, I, it's a very hard job. And and I really do think that with all the tools at the government's disposal and the, Canadian, the Bank of Canada and the Federal Reserve's disposal, it's extremely complicated. And world finance is more interlinked than it ever has been in world affairs and world relations. So one thing happens anywhere in the world and it ripples through and it has totally reduced our ability to predict the future. So, so that's what I'll say, but here's what I will say is that the, I would say the hope in all of this, because there's a lot of negativity in this. And to be honest with you, when our current government got elected, I backed off of social media for a little bit because I was a, a, a staunch opposer of them. in this <laughs> I really was. I just, I just, I just thought, when I looked objectively at what they were offering people and what and what they um, what they were really going to do, they were pulling the wool over everybody's eyes about what was best for people and what's actually what's actually. Well, I was good. a staunch opposer of their budget, <laughs> like their budget was terrible. Well, which 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 is what the government is, right? You know, I mean, what is a person other than their their accumulated uh, actions and their repeated actions, right? Um, so so I, I think that. I took a little bit of time off because I just had to cool down. I could not actually believe that, that the government landed almost identically how it did. So I didn't, this is the first video I've done in quite some time. I used to a regular monthly market update. So I got to say that this is, this is because I really, I really was upset that this, that this is the way it landed. But anyhow, here's the next thing is I, I'm getting involved with like the, the, the home owner association at my local level. Um, I feel very passionate about this because I've seen way too many people so down and out over this housing crisis. It's nothing short of a crisis. It is a flat out crisis. And so here's what I think the road forward is, because I can sit here and pick on this government all day. So can you, it's like, it appears that we both could, <laughs> but I don't think that's constructive. So what I'd like to get onto, if you're cool with it, is the topic of how do you, how do you, how do you change the way the system is rigged? You know what I mean? Like, like how do you change? It's all about incentives. Look, the fact that we have, so many workers sitting at home and we have such such high prices for the cost of goods generally speaking is because we have disincentivized production we have disincentivized labor because we are paying people to to not produce essentially work from home stay at home and so so they're needing to reduce those incentives people on can very simply understand that that's how an incentive works they can also understand that for me to sell a home i get paid that's an incentive that's how i get that's how you get paid for someone to show up and do their job on a regular basis, they have to not screw up within the confines of their job to not get fired and to continue getting paid. That's their incentive. Incentives rule and run everything. They run how animals go for food. They run how trees and plants grow in nature. Incentives run everything. And the way that the government has set up the current incentives are fixed to fail. It is made so that they're totally fixed to fail. So let's 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 talk instead of uh, like the macro sense. Let's talk about some specifics. Right. Mm. Because 
Um, sure, sure. Incentives are incentives are two are, are done in two ways. You know, you got this carrot and you got the stick, right? And both are an incentive. Carrot, you get to, you get that treat. Stick, you get the beating, right? And and so like modern economies, developed economies, typically are all financial, right? Taxes is your stick, and like government grants incentive like those kind of like low interest totally, loans are totally. the incentives right yep. like that's yep. the, that's the mechanisms that they use so like well well even look at uh you know like the um, affordable homes programs that a lot of these governments have been promoting for quite some time i kind of laugh at the fact that they've called them affordable home programs because here's the thing the answer or the, the question everybody should be asking is affordable to whom right because because affordable, like these houses are being bought by people, but they happen to be, you know, a police officer with a, a nurse wife or a teacher with, you know, a business husband, man, like a husband, whatever, right? Like there's there's all these different things, right? So then what what do you think in particular the government has been doing that you think is going to be like specifically, what do you think they're going to do to fail? Oh, gosh. I mean – there, I can't even start to name the ways. I mean, I can, I can, we'll veer off because, because I like, I can start to name the ways what's better. What I like talking about more recently is what the solution might be, because that's the only thing that doesn't just take you down a dark hole of negative. Well, how about this? The first, um, like the, um, the home buyer's bill of rights. Let's start there. You know, that was proposed. Yeah. Would that help? Oh man. So, so. So the Bill of Rights, like like this, the whole like you are we talking about you're specifically the abolishing of the blind bidding, like they, yeah, predominantly, yeah. yep. Because because I I don't think so 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 to be honest with you, I don't think it, has anybody ever been to a live auction. First of all, I'd like to ask anybody who thinks that blind bidding is the problem if they've ever a been to a live auction of any kind that's for anything that's of any sought after nature. If anyone mm -hmm. want to go into a high end art gallery where they're sought after, have you ever been to a live auction for things that people actually want? It's not pretty either. So also, have you ever been to a live auction for real estate? Because I have, and it's no better. The thing that I think is that auction market rate will prevail more efficiently in a in a in a full disclosure auction, and that's all that happens. So 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 it doesn't mean that as a whole the market will move any differently. It will move more efficiently on a home by home basis. I don't know if anybody is if the audience is familiar with market efficiencies. You think about large cap and small cap stocks. Um, in, when there's trading happening all the time, prices stay very tight to what the true value of something is at that given snapshot in time. But when there's not a lot of trading activity, they're they're they move in larger clumps, slower chunks. It's less efficient in the price. Well, I think on that I think on that though too, the difference between a housing market and a real or and a or housing market and a stock market is you know this this concept of what a perfect market is, right? Like in a perfect market, it is it both the buyers and the sellers have equal amount of information, and as yep. a result, can come to a logical and conclusive agreement as to what the value of. And that's why stocks work very great. It's close to a perfect market. Everyone's yeah, yeah. Say and so, you know, so all I want to say else. to that point, Conrad, because you nailed it. All I want to say with that is that that what market value is doesn't change. It's just how efficient people are at staying on market. So here's the thing. Is that having having uh, in my opinion blind bidding is just a little bit less efficient. So some homes are going to sell over true market. Some are actually going to sell under, and I've seen that and I know that mm -hmm. because because when there's only three offers, it doesn't go as crazy. It's kind of this crazy function of numbers when there's like twenty offers where it gets into this whole new wild card territory where sometimes when there's like three offers only, it'll actually sell below what I would deem to be the statistical uh mean average or true market value of that property i've seen ones where i can point and say hey look it only got three offers it definitely sold under what i thought it would but then you'll have ones that go way over but i think in an, a live auction just more of them will land exactly right on what they should have exact market value which in, in a sense i suppose yeah. is more fair but what people got to realize is that it's not going to reduce the fact that the graph is still going like this in blind bidding some will go over some will go under some will go over some will go over a, 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 a transparent bid they'll land more on but the fact of the matter is still that the line is going up 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 you know yeah, like I had someone explain to me once upon a time that um, the uh, the real estate market is like a yo-yo on an escalator. And that's been like my favorite analogy ever, right? Because it, it's got its ups, it's got its downs, but it's kind of always going up. You know what I mean? Yep. So yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. So like, yeah, so with the Bill of Rights, there was obviously more there. There was, you know, there was trying to make it, sure it, that me, I read were... that thing when I read, and I'll tell you what, I put out a video like a week before the election was finalized and I read their Bill of Rights. Um, and, and I put out a video kind of going on blast and all that stuff. And then once I got elected, I just, I'm just out, I, I, you know, um, 
So, so if you know any more about the Bill of Rights, I'm happy to converse with that directly. Well, how about, so here, here's the specific point. So like they were talking about, um, and, and I, last week we had Matthew Pfeiffer from bald, the bald Prairie real estate YouTube channel on, on the yep. show here. And we had, um, you know, we, we were talking kind of about a bit about blind bidding. Cause we were talking about some of the TikToks that were surrounding that. Um, and you know, he said, when it comes to inspections, cause I'm a big advocate that an inspection should be like an absolute must. Like when, when they mm -hmm. said, Hey, inspections will be mandatory. He actually brought up a really, or, or, or there, um, you have a legal right to an inspection. He actually brought up a really, really good point in how it was worded. And mm -hmm. I went back and I reread it and I was like, for Frick's sakes, he's right. Because the way it's worded is you have a legal right to a home, home inspection. I'm, like, I'm all for that. And he responded with, but Conrad, we already have that legal right. And I was like, shit, you're right. They're not saying it's required. They're saying it's a legal right, which you already do. But in a bidding war, everyone waves that legal right. Was that right. Matt who found that? Yeah. That, that, so Matt, I was Matt, like, what, that's Matt, as soon Matt, as he pointed that out, I was like, Frick, he's that, totally yeah, right. Yeah, get on so him. technically, they're like, the Bill of Rights, you know, you'll have a legal right. But they're essentially just promising you the thing you already have. Yeah, so like, yeah, for sure. And so when it, I'd like to, to talk when it comes to though the 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 uh, like not necessarily the bill of rights, but inspections and stuff like that. If there was something that was like, hey, everyone is required to have an inspection on a home, you know, would that slow yeah. things down? Would that change the bidding war situation? Would that would that? No, make a you difference? can't. Like, it's like this. It's like this. There's a river flowing. You go to throw a stick in it. The water goes around. It's got to go somewhere. The, they're, they're, the people trying to get to the homes. They'll find ways around it. They'll find ways around. People will. There's they they can't just mandate these things they've tried to do this so many times um for anybody who's interested i'm going to show you there's a beautiful book here uh let me see if i can find a copy of it uh it's called landlording in ontario i give away <laughs> copies to, i give away copies to people all the time um landlord in ontario it's by a fellow named christopher seep who's the the um head of the the, the durham landlord tenant association and and he goes ahead and chronicles very nicely in his opening chapters about the exact, exact correlation between the federal and provincial governments mandating of rent increase limits and the simultaneous mm. cease of construction of new apartment buildings. So they try oh, yeah. and do this thing. No, 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 you can't do that. And what happens? The they say you can't raise rents. Well, all the apartment, all the all these big companies are building apartment buildings. They say, well, we're 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 out, we're out, we're done. Yeah, well, and rent control in particular. Constrict. Yeah, rent control in particular has always been tough. Like it has been well documented in all modern economies across the world that a moment the government institutes some kind of rent control, you've got oh, well, sure, reduction sure. in supply. You've got. But I would say, so I would apart. further on it. It's not just that you can look at all these individual examples, but they all fit into the category of government mandated regulations that do not. Uh, actually create any real incentives. They're basically like a, 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 a potential, a, a, a proposed blockage of something. You can't just mm -hmm. do that. You go to a river, you throw a dam in there, water finds its way around. People going to homes is an unstoppable force. And you try and put in this mandatory home inspection thing, and all of a sudden you get one. It's just, they, they always try and fix it with these little patchworks. They got a boat with a thousand holes in it and they're trying to throw patches on. You need incentives. So let's go back to that as a, as a wrap up, because I think this is the most important thing is that I've talked a lot about this with people locally, and we need to come up with some sort of system whereby the federal government, when they're going to mandate these densification criteria on municipalities, if they're going to say to Peterborough, if, if, if Ontario and Canada is going to say to a town like Peterborough, you need to densify uh, X amount within the next how many years you need to use less land, house more people you need to build up and you need to up your quotas of new permanent available land. How do they do that? That is, that's where we, this is where it all comes to now. And I believe, pardon me, that we need to have some form of system whereby there is a direct, a direct reciprocation of resources based on met quotas for new housing. So for example, how do you get anyone to do, how do you get your dog to do something? How do you get your kid to do something? You, 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 you need to. Well, I can't get, get my kids to do anything. How do you, for me, if, I'm getting a new, <laughs> if I'm getting a new client, if I have a new client and I want someone to sign, sign a contract with me, I give before I take, I give before I ask, or I give for sure when I ask, there's this, always has to be a simultaneous reciprocal exchange. And so I would say the federal government, the provincial governments need to come up with some sort of system whereby they give out federal funds allocated to infrastructure, specific 
money towards the specific neighborhoods who are going to pass the developments. It's not just Peterborough. Hmm. It's North Ward, West Ward. You, you, so you're, you're talking about, you're taking it like even sub-municipal. Like you're talking about like, you're, ba- you're talking you're like basically suburbs. Well, the municipality has to have that has the municipality has to, I'm talking more like wards because they're they're actually controlled by by a ward councillor mm-hmm. and there's actually a representative there. You can't do it where there's no organized representation because right. there's actually no government, there's no there's no there's no you know, there's no there's no governing body there. But when you go down to the wards in a county, they are spoken for at a regular council meeting. Those people if someone wants to get a minor variance with within the north section of Peterborough they have to go through and that that counselor the ward counselor has got to you have to post a notice in that section of town you have to hear from the people about whether they oppose that variance or whether it's against if, so if you were about like we had mentioned before let's say though you go to the ward and you say hey we're going to we're going to dense like we're going to densify this this neighborhood we're going to put up you know you know 24 sweeter we're going to put up whatever right um and they oppose it then what so so here's the thing <laughs> right because no, no, this is exactly that's a real thing right the answer is here. The answer is here. The, where do we have who decides who gets what when in this world of government giveaways? There's splash pad over here. There's our, our for example, our city needs a new twin pad arena. And they've been discussing for a long time the location of it and how they're going to come up with the money. We also have a canoe museum that's going in with a relatively large budget. That falls under the third, third, third uh, funding <laughs> mechanism. Museum. <laughs> well, well. In, in in fairness, in fairness, Peterborough is sort of uh, the Autonomy River that runs through here is a very oh, historic okay. river, and and it. It, it it does relate back to our heritage. Uh, Peterborough has a history of manufacturing canoes. Um, ah, there it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which 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 is um you know sort of back to our 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 roots. You know, um our cultural roots. Um so so it's a preservation of history. And Peterborough's a culturally specific town that they want to plant this in. So, so there's a reasoning for it. Um, but nevertheless, it's got a massively large price tag in an environment where people people are asking, why can't money be spent on this thing or that thing? Um, for example, I think that at one point, the potential budget for this thing was upwards of $60 million, um, But now it's down wow. around. Like I, I believe they've, they've chopped it down into the mid-30s. Um, but, but nevertheless, one-third municipal money, one-third provincial money, one-third federal money. And that's the way a lot of these big infrastructure projects work. Um, they get the approvals from these uh, uh, bodies above them, and then they have they have to put in their part. And but anyhow, I think that you need to start to move towards if people want provincial and federal money for infrastructure projects, they need to show that we have permit ready, basically shovel ready projects. We want the infrastructure, but we need it because we have houses ready to go. And look, we of all the other towns, like so. Look, say Oshawa, the the the, the mayor is over there, the councilors, the 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 people of Oshawa cannot get it together. That's a town, you know, half an hour from here. That's a little bit larger than us. If those people cannot figure out where they'll put the development, that's fine. They just don't get the money for the new playground, for the new arena, for the new whatever. Whatever town okay, so, out, gets the money. So you're you're talking about the incentive being some of the other things that their voting populace is looking for, like the skating rinks, 100%. The, the parks. See that I that I could see being effective. That I could see being effective if you tied, you know, the the funding for those directly to, and then and then that actually could be a way of bringing people on board because if if someone's like, oh, I don't want that apartment complex, but the apartment complex comes with a brand new park or like a, a paddling pool or something. Hundred percent. That's the only way you need to tie with that. So if you live, so say there's uh, going to be, uh, you know, a six story building down the road from something that's all low rise, and it's going to bring new traffic to the street. So there's going to be more vehicular traffic. You got young kids, you got them on bikes, you want to do walks. It's going to be noisier. There's going to be more danger. Um, you're also going to have new residents that are a little bit, there's always some resistance to this. It's just the, the nature of a, of any town that's not of a large urban mm-hmm. uh, size that, that there's resistance. In, 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 even in any, in the old guard Toronto neighborhoods, people don't want a new mix of people that is different than what their neighborhood already consists of. It's, it's, and it's not even, you can't even get mad at people. That's how the, human nature which it's homeostasis yeah. it's it's equilibrium people don't want well, too much change do you know it's funny i actually think that um the go like the governments you know talking about federal like all of them quite frankly have, have effectively over the last 10 years kind of created a class system right because there are people who can buy homes and people who cannot buy homes and what i find funny or not funny it's actually tragic in a lot of ways like i saw a stat the other day that said 
and, and I don't know how prevalent this is, maybe you know, um, that 90% of the first time home buyers in Ontario um, had a gift or some assistance from their parents in some way. So imagine you're an immigrant. Which is just or all, that's all just recycled asset inflation money, anyhow. That's all. It's just right. blue, blue. But if you're not, a, that's my point. If you're not a part of that system, flopping over from one thing to the next. Um, but if you're not uh, a part of that system, let's say you're an immigrant no, no, or you don't have mom and dad who owned a home. 100%. And so the hard part is, is where do you land the people who are not part of that cultural class? Because that's everyone's afraid that it's going to degrade the property values when you have a different class structure anywhere nearing a separate, a, a, you know, a, a, this problem is, is alive and well in Peterborough. Absolutely. 100%. And so, so of course, how do you do it? How do you, how do you, how do you blend the, the middle roads? And just imagine like if this is your neighborhood and they're saying, we're going to put a sixplex in there. It has to be, it can't be too far from the mean of what the, the, the property prices are in that area because you can, just cannot deviate too far because you will always fail. You just can't have that. You can't have million dollar right, yeah. homes and then, and then affordable project right around the corner. doesn't work. The people don't jive on both levels. The property values do get affected. Uh, things change uh, where you, you, you need to keep the property values. It needs to be a graduation. You're hundred percent right there. Low yep. price property areas. And it needs to graduate into, that's just the, the most realistic way to have it happen. And the realistic way is the good way because we need it to happen. And so the thing is, is that if you have these incentives at whatever level tied to, Hey, Peter, bro, you get a hundred building permits ready to go. You get amount of money X for your new, oh, like your gas mains under your, your, your downtown are all corroded or you have no parking, you know, you have no public parking um, here. You have money for this. Spend it how you spend it, how you see fit to make your people approve houses. So on an individual you know? level, because that's, that's the macro on an individual, the only level, way like right down, right down to your clients though. What are you advising your clients when you're going through these bidding wars? Like, how are you, oh, how are you slowing it down? Like, are you able to slow it? Like, yeah. are you just like, and how do nah, we, it's a bit Connor, how much time do we have? What's the ideal length for one of these? I know I probably got to wrap go an hour, which is about six to seven more minutes left. Sure. Sounds good. Um, and Hey, should we ask anybody for comment? Does anybody, I feel like I've been just rambling. So I apologize. No, um, I, they, people can comment. I, I, I would, I would say let's focus more on the, if, because if people want to comment in, then we can always make a second video. Like we cool, can yeah. collab on a video or whatever. And uh, and answer the question specifically in that next video, Sounds unless good. they unless they comment now while we're chatting still. Yeah. So in regards to um, my clients right now, um, I mean, man, it changes all the time. Because well, leading up to the election, there's a lot of volatility for me. For all my buyers, I basically put them on pause. I was like, look, until we know whether we have the conservative or liberal housing platform, don't make a decision because honestly, it's going to affect what happens. And now that the liberals are in, right. I, we're in an extremely inflationary environment. My my attitude is, if you're a buyer. Um, yes, there's some risk involved, but there's a risk in being in and there's a risk in being out. Um, because the, the risk in being in is that the housing prices fall and the risk in being out is that they actually do what they did last year and go up another hundred grand. And, <laughs> and then you missed out on a hundred grand that all your friends have made and they now have to spend on their next home that you don't in the future. And it's impossible for you to make that money tax free at your, at your job. So, so, so it's risky no matter what. So everyone has a vested interest in this now, whether they want to or not. And this is a very hard topic with every buyer because it's a real discussion. And the thing that it comes back to is that risk tolerance is relative to timeline. Risk is always relative to time. So I would agree. Do you need to sell? Is there a risk that you might have to move back to Toronto in two years because your job calls you back? If yes, might not be the best time to buy because as far as I can see, and I'm talking honestly, right? and that's my honest opinion. As far as I can see, things might ratchet up another 75,000, another 15 to 20% this year in the city of Peterborough. Mm -hmm. That's my prediction. But if for any reason they don't, you need to be protected by time because if it all turns and you have to sell at the, at that period, it, the, the loss is only real when you have to realize it by selling. But Correct. In, if you have a 10 year timeline, it, you're going to be fine because here is the thing is that, with this current government, if they last their full four years right now, what happens is look at COVID. We had arguably statistically the, the deepest, quickest, worst unemployment event in the history of North America happen with COVID. And we bounced back in two months. We had a little blip in our real estate market two months. Do you know how? Because immediately the government realized we need to stabilize confidence because money when you get down to the philosophical thought of what money is 
it's it's value in exchange and if people have to believe there has to be a belief system in that monetary value and in that whole system and the very nature of a fiat currency value of real estate, when people stop believing in the value of real estate then it, you poo, the, what's holding it all together is confidence and belief and so the government just says holy cow let's inject 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 money into this thing and that's what they did and they saved it and they learned their lessons from the 2007 2008 subprime crisis where they put out at the time was an unprecedented bailout package but and at the time, it was also an unprecedented speed that they put it out at. But arguably, it was too slow. It was too slow. Look, they could look look at our look at how quick the unemployment dropped in Canada and in North America, and look at how quickly they recovered the markets. We had a tiny little blip for two months, and then all of a sudden, the prices skyrocketed. They injected liquidity at historically record amount. They dropped. They slashed the interest rates. They had. Serb going out like it was an ATM that nobody was standing in front of, just <laughs> printing out money. They they just said we have to save the confidence, so they did it. And what's going to happen if it crashes again? What happens if because the only reason that I would say that it could crash right now, and a lot of people agree, and I talk to a lot of smart people about this consistently, obsessively, is it's it's something to do with the financial markets. Arguably, there's asset bubbles all over this entire. Well, there's definitely our, our asset bubbles world. in all of your equities, right? Like equities. Your, your the equities are all in like bubbles. Exactly. Sure. Everything's in bubbles. Everything's in bubbles. So the problem is, is that all it takes is one collapse of confidence in, in the equity market. We have some gain stop. We have some, um, you name it. There's just some crazy announcement about a government ban on crypto technologies. And there's a but plus. And, you know, any distortion. And historically speaking, when there's a banking collapse, when there's any credit collapse, real estate collapses in kind because real estate is dependent upon the flow of large See, amounts. And here's of why I think your timeline situation makes, or your timeline comment makes a lot of sense. Particularly, the longer you can stretch it out over, the lo the less your risk truly is. Because once again, mm -hmm. even if there is a dip, in theory, it should recover, even if you, you last it's, long enough. Yeah, it's going up. But, it's in a way, but it's going up. Yeah. But it's it's funny because you know you still have a lot of people who are actively trying to buy homes and stuff like that. So even if there was some kind of collapse, I actually think that it would be a flattening of the housing market, not a crash, because you still have so much pent up demand and so little supply that the crash would reduce this, the demand. But I don't actually think it would reduce the demand below. No, no, I agree. I totally supply agree. Issue. I, I totally agree. And look, here's two things to back that up that are major real factors is one, we have a government that philosophically thinks about money a totally different way than any government that we've seen in recent history. We have Christia Freeland, who is drinking oh, the Kool-Aid of, of really, she, she, she believes in print and spend. She is Keynesian to the core and beyond. She is print, 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 give, 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 give. And, and so we have an inflationary minded government. So this government's immediate, immediate response, say interest rates have to go up. For any, they, they do. Just, just to curb generalized inflation. And, and when we all Let's, know they do. I'm going to take you away know, the mystery here. Rate, interest sure. rates are going up. We out. can't even get into that because that'll be a whole other topic. But to curb the generalized asset inflation going across all product classes right now, the interest rates have to go up. They have to curb, they have to curb consumption. But what's this government going to do if there's even a waffle, even a little in the real estate market confidence? They are going to do whatever it takes, say whatever it takes to prop up that confidence, whether it's specific targeted money at home buyers, or as you've probably already, like I read in your intro, which was a great thing that uh, the amortizations in Sweden, they're up to what, 102 years. W tell me yeah. how, if, if, if they have to up the interest rates, explain to me how it's not going to be just a matter of a month before the government comes up to the podium and says amortization is extended to 30, 35 years to regulate the housing costs. Yeah. You know, well, to be honest, I actually think the amortization, they should have left it. It shouldn't have been 25 years. It should have been 30, 35. I think there's other things they should have changed, but yeah. For sure. So so here's the thing. We have a government that's so pro-spend, pro-liquidity, pro-growth that if it wobbles at all, if the global financial markets wobble at all, if they see anything wrong, they're just going to throw so much money at this thing, more than you ever even thought conceivable to save it. They will not watch it go down on their watch. Or they will attempt not to. But here's the thing. You have hyperinflation issues that can always round about. But here's... Well, but here's I'm more concerned about, about stagflation than hyperinflation. <laughs> well, well, here's the thing. Stagflation and hyperinflation are, are, are very, very, very tricky topics. They're very deep, very, very complicated topics. And I obviously can only scratch the surface on them. But what I do know is that when hyperinflation really comes to a collapse in, 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 a, in a head and when it actually pops, when a currency collapses and when assets collapse, is when people lose the confidence 
in that asset or in that currency. So when you look at the, the classical, uh, the Argentina has, has had, um, you know, in hyperinflation several times. Germany has had a hyperinflation. Um, yeah. Zimbabwe, there is countless, countless cases of hyperinflation where currencies actually got basically abandoned and restarted. But what happened is that people lost confidence in that civilization, that culture, that government in general. So they abandoned the currency, but more, more they abandoned the belief system and the democracy there. Because when you have these third world countries that had a currency that they tried to hyperinflate it, it was only based on some kind of corruption, which it's arguable that that's happening with our government now. But I will say that the thing is, is that on a global scale, Canada is still viewed as such a peaceful, um, great place to, to live that even if we hyperinflate to the moon, globally, we are on the map as like a Sweden, a Switzerland, uh, a safe haven, a, a political wow. safe haven. A government safe haven. You know what I mean? So I think that people will not lose faith in Canada. At least I don't think. Well, here's a fun fact, though. Maybe, maybe not. Because, you know, there's a there's a book out there, Currency Wars. It's actually really – it's a really good read. Um, it's interesting. But, um, you know, he talks about how the fact that um, there are only a couple, a couple countries in the history of the world that have not declared bankruptcy. So wrap your head around that concept that there are <laughs> that there are countries that have literally declared bankruptcy. Now oh, Canada yeah. happens oh, to yeah. be have one. You, have you, uh, let me, Canada let me happens stop. to be one that hasn't declared bankruptcy, but that's simply because it is just too young. And I really hope that we're not. I I, I don't think we're in have bankruptcy you, territory. Have you? Oh yeah. This, this time is different. Yeah, yeah I've read this, that. For one. anybody yeah. who hasn't just dabbled into that, it's just it's as simple as saying like, look, tornadoes happen all over the world. There's never been a place they haven't happened. And blah 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 blah, and then it's like it's it's just basically saying that the more you stretch out history, sooner or later Canada's gonna have a big problem. That's basically what yeah. you get out of this, you know, hundred um, percent. Yeah. And so so, but when you but I really hope that's not the case. It, I hope that's not the case. <laughs> we got. I hope that's not the case. And that's where the government needs to stabilize people's confidence and their ability to repay and service the debt. And that's really what it what what that comes back down to is is it's 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 no different than if you have a spouse that's got a credit spending problem or something. People, you know, like and and or. Or just say, say you have a kid that needs money all the time. Dad, I need a bit of money for that. I need a bit of money for that. But you know that he repays you. But then eventually, you know, one time he borrows five grand, he pays it back. Next month he needs 10, but then he asks for another 20 and then whatever. And then instead of buying more lawn gear for his lawn mowing a company and you realize he's not making investments in his business, he's not spending your money in a way that he can make more money. He's just going out on trips. He's, you want that? I want to go to Thailand. I want to do it. And all of a sudden he's taking more money. You're like, wait a second. He might not repay me. This might not come back. And I think that. Yeah. I think that people's faith in Canada to, 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 to ever balance the budget, obviously that's this current government is foregoing the thought of ever balancing it. That's gone. That's gone. You know? Yeah. Well, um, and here's the thing though, to that point though, I wouldn't want them to um, like, for instance, like the, the conservative government had said, you know, we're going to try to balance the budget in 10 years or whatever. And I looked at the numbers and what had currently been spent. And I'm like, that's too fast. You know, that's a good way to cause stagflation. Oh, well, but here's the biggest problem. It's going to take them. 20, 30 years. Well, the problem is that the interest rates got to go up. And so and they will. And they will. Well, well, and when they do, and when they do, the secondary bond markets will will price the these bonds accordingly. As soon as there's any money to be made in the debt market instead of the equities market, if you have interest rates, if they ever reach 3% again, people aren't going to want to take these these terrible mass printed government bonds at, at one and a half. And so people are going to bid a market rate up on those bonds. And then when the secondary trading market on the bonds goes to a higher interest rate, the primary market's going to, the price that people are willing to be paying for these bonds is going to go down and the government's going to have nowhere to, to issue new debt to that's going to, they're going to command yeah. a higher. So basically the, 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 the interest on the government debt is going to go up and the government will not be able to service the debt. They can't pay off the debt. If we can't pay off the deficit when the interest rates are zero, when can we? Oh, Mitch, they just got to print more money. <laughs> see that's the problem is we are just they got to ride this thing out to the end and that's what scares me is the fact the thought the thought because it expands it can't stop it has to keep expanding you either balance it you get rid of it or you expand it and it can't expand into infinity so the thing is the thing is is that the timing of a collapse event because there will be a mat if they continue to expand it and they do not even attempt to balance it there will be a collapse event it will be massive it will be chaotic but the thing is is that it could be in three years now or it could be 15 the timing, right. the time, the timing of it is impossible. To but predict. once again, if you buy a home and you stay in it for a long enough period of time, you will weather it one way or the other, right? Because at the end of the day, unlike other assets like a stock market, like stocks in a stock market or whatever, there's underlying assets. A home, 
at the end of the day has a price to build. And yep. what I, one of the reasons why I got involved in, uh, in real estate to begin with. So like years ago before I was even a mortgage broker. So this is like more than 10 years ago now, I remember sitting down and it was like a builder's conference and I don't can't even remember why I was there, but I, I listened to the one guy and he was like this guy retiring. He's like 60 something years old and he had like worth obviously a ton of money. And he's like, the reason why I cho chose real estate is because no matter what happens, everyone needs a place to live. And I thought, Oh shit, that's true. <laughs> well, well, I was like, I got to get into real that's estate. <laughs> but, but, that's, but here's the thing, Conrad, that's only a good analogy because of one constricting uh, parameter. So here's the thing is you can say, uh, I'm going to be a plumber because people always need to go to the bathroom. That's not a great theory because yes, people always need to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Anyone else can become a plumber. Anyone else can become a plumber. Okay. So here's the problem is that you can have, you can't have one plumber for every person that's to go to the bathroom. The ratio is wrong. Cause there's not enough. You can't only take <laughs> one job a year. As you're a plumber, you need 40 jobs a year or, or 60 jobs sure. a year. So you need a balance of the amount of plumbers out there. So, so the fact that people always need homes, is not sufficient in and of itself to mean that that's going to make it a good investment. The reason it's a good investment is because people are always going to need homes. And as far as it appears right now, historically in Canada, we're always going to have a government that is not pro construction. Do you know, understand we're, yeah. we, no matter what, we are in an environmental crisis simultaneous to a population crisis. And this is not just our government. This is worldwide. We have climate issues. We have carbon emissions issues we have land use planning restriction issues based off of agricultural needs and and natural preservation needs and we have a growing population that is in an exponential function anybody who watches the population graphically knows it ain't pretty that we as a human species are multiplying too quickly and we can simply <laughs> not we simply cannot build quick enough to match the amount of populace we have because if we did so, we would decimate our Earth's ability to provide for us. So it is just simply impossible to build the amount of well, homes I that we need. Well, I think Canada to. is quite far from that. I mean, we have one of the biggest land masses. Oh we yeah, oh yeah, people. we do. <laughs> like, we got, we, we got, we got, we got some time. We do, we do. But honestly, like, like heaven forbid that we become a China where you can't even see through the smog that you drive in. You know, um, and 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 it it, it it can happen so quickly. How how quickly air air quality and everything can get turned around, right? So. I, I think that if people are being realistic, the fact of the matter is that more people are going to have to live on less land because we have to conserve our land as a people, as a human species, we have to conserve our land. There's just no way around it. So what that means is that in the long, 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 long run is that we will live in smaller homes on less land up higher. So every detached dwelling that you buy right now will in the long run, if you could project a thousand years out, imagine so many of these single family homes, California actually just recently passed statewide legislation that every single family dwelling can be zoned as a fourplex. That is groundbreaking. Like every single home oh, can be a fourplex. That. Every single home can be a fourplex. I read that in the economist. And, and so they've been dealing with one of the worst housing crisis for the, oh, we're not California's new. been bad for for long. We're not time. unique in this. Yeah, they have some some uh, ridiculous proportion of, of 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 America's entire population. I think it's like thirteen percent. They have like twenty eight percent of their homelessness problem. Um, so so they're not new to this. And and the thing is, is that the land what you can always you can make new. But yeah. Homes. So okay. So they pass that, but are their builders scooping them up? Or is there like are they well, like well no there? no they're they're having to so first of all there's like massive revolts at the at the local level at the at the at the you know the city <laughs> level and everything um think a lot look at look at the amount of you got you got I have to research city. that after I never heard that it's a very interesting one that they're kind of trailblazing they're they're years ahead of us in this crisis well, which I also a, find funny that we try to think that we can do this problem. We're not re we're not writing this book. This book is being written. It's been written in Europe years before us. It's been written in California a decade before us. We're not new to the game in this. This is we're 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 getting into it for the first time as a as a province of Ontario and as a Canada a country of Canada. But this is not a unique problem. So, but what I would say is that you yes, you can make more homes, you can make more dwellings, but you cannot make more land. So that is where the real thing comes is that in the long run a lot of these little single detached dwellings right now are going to have to be demolished at some point and built up and the return on investment of building up and placing 10 homes on one piece of property is exponentially larger than having one or two homes and so the thing is is that the more homes you can own the more land you can own right now that is in the path of development you are in the clear you know, like how many people are on board with it, but even then no. look at some of the incentives that have been put through a lot of times. And I think there's, there's an education piece here for Canadians is that, 
uh, a lot of Canadians, you know, especially when they see an article or something like that, most don't read past the headline. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, you, you see this, you see this article and all of a sudden it's, you know, this government giving a previous, not this government, the previous governments giving builders incentives. And it's like, oh, the rich people are getting the money again. Like they're giving handouts. It's like, well, no, like that's, what's required in order to motivate the people who can actually accomplish those things. Uh you know yeah. I mean? Yeah. And I mean, the reason but I think there's an education need, piece there, the reason the builders even need incentives to begin with is because the land use planning um, um, system is, is, is so convoluted that the reason there's not a free market, there isn't really capitalism doesn't exist within the new construction industry. Uh, it's more like uh, it, it's more like the telecom industry where there's three big giants and they can act as a cartel because but you know what? It's because it's complex too, though. Right. I mean, when is the last time someone's gone to go get a permit for a, a deck or a fence? It's no, no, absolutely. absolutely. So that's the thing. Let alone when it's, you do a house. <laughs> it's just systematically, it's the way that it is. The, the the builders that have prevailed in the current market are not the ones who built the best home, service their clients the best, any of that. It's the ones who learn how to navigate the system of, of mm -hmm. buying land and getting permits the best. That's all it is. So so, anyways, the 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 city having to give grants to begin with is is they're just trying to make up for their own mistake. They already made in making the planning and approvals so convoluted and so off the mark and out of touch with actual needs. Yeah. So I think that's a good place to stop. I think, you know, we've covered a lot there that the government obviously needs to increase that bidding wars are probably here to stay, I think is what we're saying, right? For, yes. for quite some yes. time. Um, but, you know, Mitch Cleary from Peterborough, Ontario, if anybody is watching and uh, this right now and is needing uh, some more YouTube experience, Mitch Cleary actually has a YouTube channel as well. I put the link in the description below. Make sure you go check out some of his stuff. And uh, thanks for joining us. Totally. Yeah. And you guys can get me on my Instagram too, at Mitch Cleary uh, Real Estate. And um, yeah, I was just going to say, Conrad, before we wrap up, I just want to make sure that I precursor this because I do, I know a lot of building officials. I know a lot of people that are involved in both sides of government and politically uh, opinionated on both sides. And I just want to say, not my opinion to offend anybody. Uh, I think very <laughs> highly of all the work that our, our honestly, all our municipal um, um, staff do. And a lot of them are my own uh, uh friends and, and, and we have relations there, but I, I, I believe we have sy systemic issues. And so not to point a finger at any individual here, uh, hopefully everybody can see, see and agree with some of the points that we made. Right on. Thanks, Mitch. Awesome. Thanks, Conrad.